Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 89 of the CU Insight Experience. This episode is brought to you by our friends at BSCU. As the nation's premier payments CUSO, BSCU proudly supports the success of more than 1,500 credit unions. My name is Randy Smith. I'm one of the co-founders of CUInsight.com, and it is my job on the show to have conversations with the best and the brightest of the credit union community. I get to pick their brains and see if we can't find a few nuggets that we can all learn from. My guest on today's show is Catherine Davis. Catherine is the president and CEO of Valley First Credit Union in California. I read an interview a few weeks back that Catherine gave and just thought it was amazing. So I, I reached out to her through LinkedIn and asked if she'd be on the show. She said yes, and here we are. We talked about Catherine's path to her current position as president and CEO. I appreciated her willingness to talk about the struggles that were involved in getting there. And she had advice for others that are trying to move into the C-suite, but also, which I thought was powerful, was the advice that she has for the people that are actually doing the hiring, uh, you know, to, to have more diversity, to see more women in the C-suites of credit unions. We also talked about disruption in financial services, what credit unions need to do to be successful, not only during the global pandemic that we're all experiencing, but also afterwards. Catherine was great to share so many of the leadership lessons she's picked up along the way, and also some misconceptions on what it means to what many people think it means to be a good leader. It was just a, a fun conversation. As always, we wrapped this all up with the uh, rapid fire questions to wrap up the whole show. I knew this conversation was going to be a lot of fun. It, it's one of those conversations where we kept talking even after we uh, stopped recording. Uh, I think we're enjoying it so much. I think you're really going to enjoy this conversation too. And there are some nuggets that you will, uh, I'm sure, take away from it. So, Without further ado, I give you my conversation with Katherine Davis. Enjoy. Katherine, welcome to the show. Hello, how are you? I am fantastic. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, interesting times we're all going through. <laughs> Very interesting times, indeed. Every day is different. Hey, that is the truth. We were talking about that before we hit the record button. Uh, it gives us a lot to talk about. I saw on LinkedIn a, a little while back that you gave an interview to Mortgage Women Magazine. Well done on that. I, I just I loved your answers. I instantly had to reach out to you. I wanted to get you on the podcast. So uh, again, thanks for being here today. It sparked so many questions for me. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. And I will say I was a little bold on that, but hey, I just, you got to put yourself out there, especially in times right like yeah. this. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And, and we'll link to that article as well, the interview you gave there in the show notes. So I, I hope everybody goes out and checks that one out too. And we'll try to go in a couple different directions here. One of the topics, and you mentioned it in the interview that you gave there that I've tried to keep front and center on the podcast over the past year and a half is DEI. And you spoke about getting more women into the C-suite. <laughs> yeah. and, and like your path to becoming a CEO. And, you know, first, if you could talk about that path for you personally, and, uh, you know, some of those obstacles that maybe you faced along the way. Yeah, for sure. It was a painful path, to be really frank. Yeah. Um, and I feel like it's kind of been like this life lesson on like, just keep at it, be tenacious. So that's what I for sure would, would share with with anyone trying to get into that corner office, you know, male yeah. or female. For me, like most folks, I, you know, stumbled into credit unions and, you know, <laughs> worked my way up on my background is in marketing. Absolutely loved what I was doing. Um, you know, probably around 2009, I was thinking from a, you know, career development pathing perspective, which I also recommend to folks is just sort of think about like, you know, where do you envision yourself 10 years from now? Although I'll admit in 2009, I wasn't thinking it would take 10 years to get years. here, which yeah. is in fact what happened. But, you know, right around that time frame, I really was thinking about, you know, what is that next step and where do I eventually want to be? And, you know, I was like, I want to be a CEO. I think I can do it. I think my background and what I can give and contribute back to the community, the industry, I want to be in that spot. And so... You know, that's 2009. And think about that time frame too. Probably right, not a right. great time to put yourself out there. But, um, you know, I don't know. I did. And so then in 2010, I started to put myself out there. And to my delight and surprise, I'm I'm actually getting interviews. I, I, and I'm actually sort of kind of, you know, down in that, I think the first one down in the top 12, then the top six. And then, you know, because obviously, I'm recognizing this could be a practice moment, right? So I, right. I'm... Right. And just put myself out there and I get the first job you apply for. 
But then a couple of years into it, when you're in the top three, the top five, and you realize you're the token candidate and you sort of the feedback you get from recruiters is all over the place, right? It's sort of the, well, like, oh, it was just, you don't have enough of the financial background, too much marketing. Um, the others were, you know, you kind of were just too much or you don't have enough experience or like it was always something. And I'm like, well, which is it? And so obviously that's really discouraging and just really, really difficult to just continue going. Um, but I did. Yeah. Um, and I had the good fortune to be hired by a company up in San Francisco called Balance, which yep. is a nationwide nonprofit that is, you know, focused on financial empowerment or a HUD approved housing counseling agency. I will admit when I received that particular phone call from the recruiter, um, I had just returned from maternity leave. Like literally, I was back on the job like a month. And I also, you know, my family and I, we had relocated to a bigger house closer to my credit union that I was working at the time, sort of not like an ideal time, like right to be entertaining. And the you know, first thing I said to the recruiter, I said, well, why is it you're phoning me? This is like, this isn't number one, that's not a credit union. Right. Yeah. Um, and sort of, you know, what he walked me through is he's like, you're exactly what they need. They're like, you know, retooling this organization. They need someone with a credit union background. And I think one of the things that I learned in that process Obviously, fit is key with with boards. And one thing, and my husband has been like my biggest champion throughout this. In fact, he was the one that was like, you should just go interview for that job. I was not going to go interview for it because I was so sort of just soured on the experience. Yeah. And I'll say, like in that three years while I'm out interviewing, it's not that I don't love my job and love the organization that I was working for. Like I actually would have been quite content to have re retired from there. Like I loved, and that was Exceed Financial. I absolutely yep. loved yeah. working there. I loved right? working for yeah. Born. It was a great <laughs> experience. But, you know, honestly, like if you've got, you know, aspirations to, you know, sort of do something, you know, bigger outside of that, that is sort of what kept me going. And so he was the one that said, just go check it out. So I literally go to the first interview with the checking out and really just fell in love, fell in love with the mission, but really connected with the board. And I think that was something too that my husband always encouraged me. He said, you know what? He goes, what you have to give, you have to find the right board that is interested in receiving that. He goes, not every board is going to be a fit for you, Catherine. And so, you know, so then off I went to balance and it was fantastic. About 18 months in now, a light bulb went off for me based on the work we were doing and some of the things that I learned. And I realized I needed financial products to do what I'm just really, really passionate about. And it is that financial empowerment. And, and you know, Balance had some, but that what you're looking for, like in a traditional financial institution, obviously Balance, that's not their, their structure. And so, you know, kind of 18, 24 months in, I'm like, you know, I, I think I probably want to take this back into, into credit unions. Yeah, and yeah. So fast forward, you know, I, I spent um, just a little over five years at, at Balance. And then the, the good folks at Valley First gave me a call. And here, here I am today. <laughs> I've talked to other folks on the podcast about this. And a lot of the times when it's like been the internal candidate, right? Where it, they actually get to the CEO level, but that seems to be rather rare, right? So the idea right. that, I mean, you had to leave, you were still in the credit union space, but you had to leave the, like, you know, a, a natural person credit union basically to get the first shot as a CEO to then and come relocate. back in and relocate too. And right? relocate. Yeah. And we've relocated again too. I mean, so that's something too I always share with folks. Like put yourself out there. I got to tell you, the relocation yeah. is very hard because your entire support network goes right. out the window, yeah. right? So like your family, your friends. And so now, you know, not only are you sort of figuring out what's going on at a new job, but then you're also just sort of figuring out just, you know, that personal aspect. Absolutely. So we're, we're, we're two times on this now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's, 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 it's hard. It's, it's very, very hard. Absolutely. I feel like a lot of the times when we're talking to, you know, women, female CEOs, it's always like, what advice would you give other females? I, and I wanted to twist that a little bit. You know, I think you, you've already given some great advice on that. But when we're talking about boards and the people that are actually doing the hiring in the C-suite, what advice would you give them? <laughs> You know, I think just to be open. And I, I think by and large boards... I, I don't think that it's not that they're not open to others or they're not open to diversity, but to be really frank, I think it scares them. And I think they don't know what to do with it. And I'll be really honest. I, I you know, 
my board, they probably when they see me coming every month, I, I think I kind of make them a little nervous because I'm like, hey, how about this? How about right? Like I'm I'm pushing them at the same time they're pushing me. Like <laughs> so I think it's just to to be open and to be open to different types of candidates with different types of experience. You know, the world likes to put everything in a box, Absolutely. right? So especially yeah. like I sort of look at this like with kids. And I'm like, you know what? My kids don't fit in a box and they're fabulous and they are who they are. And you know what? My kid, my, my employees don't fit into boxes either. Mm-hmm. I believe everybody has a special gift to give to the universe. And I think that we shouldn't be so you know, hung up on checking boxes versus kind of get to know people and what they have to deliver. And I think boards need to be educated on that. And they oftentimes aren't. And that was, that was like a big thing I put in that article. I think recruiters are doing our industry a huge disservice. Huge. Right? So <laughs> I see you smiling there. So I think just to sort of, you know, help boards in that process, because I think it's uncomfortable naturally and, and not because they're not interested in, I think they legitimately, it's so far out of their comfort zone. Yeah. I'd say, I'd, over the past year, I've learned more about that with Jill starting humanity than I would have ever thought, you know, and, but it's, that was her whole idea was taking a look at the way that people are recruiting it, you know, is in doing that, uh, you know, in a different way. And she often talks about bringing your whole self to work, you know, and it's yes, that's something that, that resonates, you know, I mean, because our whole selves are all different, right? So absolutely, <laughs> I was looking forward to this because of your experience, uh, you know, it, just talking about disruption. There was a lot of disruption going on in financial services before this all started, right? You know, and, and yes. now this, this shared experience we're all going through called COVID uh, the past few months, in the interview that you gave, and it was something that I've said for years as well, is this idea that credit unions have moved historic, like historically, we've just moved slow yes. <laughs> as an industry. I've been impressed with some that I've you know talked to over the past few months on how quick they moved and talking to other CEOs, almost that idea like, we can move fast. Like there's yes. no, like that time frame keeps, you know, when uh, Chuck Purvis was on the show, he talked about that time frame now being reduced. Like we don't need to wait a year, you know? Yes. So, <laughs> um, I, so I, I mean, what's been the biggest change that you've seen, not only in credit unions, but I know you pay attention to the industry overall as well. So, yeah, well, I mean, we're, I, I think part of the reason we're like slow to react, we're, we're a conservative industry, right? Like we're conservative by nature. So I think where you are starting to a certain degree, like we're forced to do things a little more quickly, because if you don't take any action, like you're going to be completely left behind. Right. So I think that is sort of prompting people I can't spend 12 months putting something out, right? right like I got to right. get to it. But I, I think it is, you know, folks putting themselves out there and just being like a little bit riskier, right? And, and obviously not risking from a fiduciary perspective, but kind of taking some more calculated risks and sort of jumping into things, you know, you know just frankly, just speeding up how you're, how you're doing it. I think oftentimes, you know, stuff is so slow because you're just overly cautious and when you think about, you know, our, our brothers and sisters in the in the tech world, yeah. they're, they're just fail fast, put it out there. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's like a foreign concept to us here. So I, I think just sort of the nature of number one, not wanting to be left behind. People are like, I better step it up. But then I think number two, just kind of putting yourselves out there and, and you know, just being a little bit riskier. Is there something that you think credit unions overall need to do or fundamentally change, you know, to stay relevant going forward with all that? disruption change going on? So this might sound too basic or old school, but I think we need to return to our roots. Every day, all day, we need to be looking at who we're serving and put ourselves out there for that. And I think oftentimes we get tripped up with the regulator. We get tripped up with oh, like this is going to be difficult or then we're going to manage this separately. You know what? we've got to put ourselves out there for our membership and our community and your seg, whoever it is you're serving, whatever those roots are, you got to double down on the credit union strategy. That, yeah, that's, what, that's what I think from a relevancy perspective. I think those that really are acting very bank-like, you know what, then flip your charter, become a community bank. And community bankers do good things in our community too. But if you're going to be a credit union, now more than ever, double down on it. Be the credit union. I love that. Yeah. Uh, when you look back over the first few months, personally, how have you grown as a leader? I mean, none of us have been through a global pandemic before, so. <laughs> right? You know, for sure, digging digging deep, <laughs> digging really deep every day. Um, you know, I, I think 
Um, I'll, I'll say for sure my, my parenting skills have come to work more often than not. But I think also um, just it's a vulnerable time. And I think to sort of be showing that to employees as well, because, you know, there'll be, you know, things again are changing and happening daily. And it's kind of like, I don't know at the moment either. And I will let my team know that we obviously, you know, we'll make mistakes and we'll fix them. And we're trying to navigate as as quickly as possible. So I think just by being vulnerable and open and and sharing that, like we're we're in it together. And to your point, yeah, I've never experienced this either. So I'm trying to figure it out with my team. I think that transparency has been important, <laughs> right? Like we, and I think it's appreciated, uh, you know, from our colleagues. So uh, the last question in the first part of the show, this section, if we were to sit down a year from now, what are you most proud of that you and your team at Valley First Credit Union have accomplished? If you could break out that, what I'm sure is a very foggy crystal ball <laughs> for me. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm a really optimistic person. So despite this craziness we have happening, it's actually really um, solidified stuff for us here at Valley First. And, and you know, we are doubling down on that credit union strategy on serving the community. So when I look forward 12 months from now, that community impact will be just huge. And so, you know, we've we've woken up in, in COVID and we found ourselves in the small business. We're, we're offering small business accounts. We are SBA lenders under the PPP program, which we didn't do that before. Right. But when, yeah. you know, when you looked around the landscape and you saw the money coming into our community, I'm like, that's not enough. Like we've got to jump in. To date, we've done 17 million of it. Wow, that's impressive. And so, and well, then now well we're like, okay, we're going to do other SBA lending. Yeah, I was just going to so say, think, you, you'd never done it. So that's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, when I look 12 months forward, I, I think we've just really doubled down on working on what's going on locally here in, in our community. And, you know, it's helping get people into homes. It's, it's right now we're doing a lot of stuff with our local counties in terms of helping small business and um, a super cool opportunity. We're in a sense sort of helping process these micro grants are being put out by two of our local counties. And so we're really like ingrained in, in what's going on at that community level and, and, you know, helping people. So I think 12 months from now, we'll, we'll see that we do around that type of work as well. So I'm, I'm excited and, I, and I'm hopeful. I feel, I feel it's the perfect time for what our community needs us to be, to be doing. That is Pretty cool. I, I'll tell you, that's been one of the fun parts that I've heard over the past few months is how many credit unions like yours have gotten into kind of spaces and partnerships, even like you said, with your local, yep. with like a couple of counties that are in the area. When James Wildman was on the show up in Alaska, he talked about working yep. with the state to process some small business stuff, you know, and it was like the, so the credit union stepping up when those PPP loans first came out, we yep. saw the big yep. banks shutting down, right? Like they were, so yeah, that's, that's pretty amazing. I, I love hearing that. Uh, on to the second part of the show, keep things moving along here, the leadership and the life acts section. I always love to start. We talked a little bit about your path to becoming a president, you know, the president and CEO, but what, what, like, what was the inspiration to take the, to take your current gig? So, you know, coming out of um, San Francisco, most recently, a really progressive city, very, I would say sort of leaders in financial empowerment. And when I looked at what's happening in the Central Valley, there's a huge, huge gap here. And I honest to God feel like it's a calling. Like this was meant for yeah. me. And the timing is right too, because I started, there's lots of discussions going on locally in my community, both again, at the local government, with local business leaders, with nonprofits, and they really were missing that financial institution. I feel like I found my tribe very quickly mm-hmm. here. And yeah. again, I sort of was just sort of surveying, you know, we, we have a very high poverty rate compared to the rest of the state. And I also just kind of looking at some of their different programs and offerings, I recognize the opportunity. And it just, it literally, I'm like, the valley's waiting for me and I'm coming. Yeah. So you really kind of... I, it sounds like odd, but I think it really was just sort of the the landscape of who is there in the community and seeing that that gap. It's like the moment I've been waiting for in life, to be really that's honest. Cool. <laughs> well, that's that's fun. So so now how how has that inspiration changed since you've been on the job? Yep. You got the office, you got the corner um, office. To be quite honest, it's actually intensified. Like I felt it was like pretty intense getting here. I I mean I feel like I'm just on this really big mission in life. I think I'm also so I'm I'm 48 years old, you know, so I'm, you're kind of looking at that 50 marker and I'm like, holy smokes. If 50 is the halfway mark, and I know it isn't for, for everybody, but for me, it's going to be the halfway mark. <laughs> I haven't done a fraction of the things I want to 
accomplish and do. So that mission component of my life that's always been there, it is really accelerated right now. Really accelerated. So yeah, it, I, it definitely, I would say it's intensified in the last 12 months. We're in the same age <laughs> band, let's just say. So it's, <laughs> I, I understand what you're talking about there. As a leader, is there something that your team has heard you say so many times they can finish your sentence? <laughs> I was going to sound morbid, but I always say, <laughs> I always say, we're not saving lives around here. Nobody is going to die from any decision we make. And I say that because number one, it's true. Like we're not in healthcare. Thank God. Right. Yep. Um, and I want to, I always want to have this learning environment. And so I'm like, if we make a mistake, it, everything's fixable. Like there's nothing that we could do here that would be so horrible that somebody would die. I feel like I've said that often too when we were first coming up in CU Insight. It's like, right? I was going to die from this. I don't like the sight of blood. So I'm not a doctor or a nurse or anything. So, um, it is a, it, this is a question that I added even before this pandemic started, but I think it's, I've, I've loved asking it recently because I know we've all had to do it as leaders is, you know, you have to make that difficult decision. Yeah. So, you know, and sometimes that decision, short term, people might not fully see it or, or, or like that. Is that something that like you always had the ability to do or is that something that you kind of had to grow in yourself as you were coming up? So I would say I got really good at that when human resources moved in my division when I was a senior vice president Okay, and just basically having to deal with the people element and, you know, whether you're you know asking people to leave or change or whatever the case might be. So unfortunately, I do feel like it's a bit of a practice, you know, skill. And I feel my time in, in human resources sort of prepped me for it, maybe a little bit better. I think for me, obviously, that's sort of another spot, like you're reaching deep within. But I think it's also a spot where I'm, I'm big on communication. And obviously, I have a background with that corporate communication. So I can recognize that it doesn't feel good because to be quite honest, making tough decisions don't feel good, even if I'm the one making the decision. But I think as long as you can explain and help people understand, it, it humanizes it as well. And I, I think people realize you know, where you're coming from too as a, as a business leader. So the communication piece of it, I think is what helps me navigate. Like, like that's where I go, I go back to. That's a good place to go back to. Um, is there a common myth about being a leader that you would like to debunk? <laughs> I think people think it's easier than it is. <laughs> you know, I think sort of people are thinking like, oh man, you're so lucky. Like you get the corner office or oh, you get to call all the shots. I think people don't recognize like the stress that comes with that. And the fact that it's never, there's never an off switch. Like I, I'm focused on Valley First seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every day, all day. I'm focused on Valley First. I'm focused on, on my team. I'm focused on my members. And I'm not sure, unless you're sort of like, you know, starting to move up the ranks, you sort of think about, you think about that. I, I think people think it's easier than it is. When you think back to earlier in your career, is there a mistake that you made or now that you're a leader that you see young leaders make? Mm, that's a good question. You know, I think this is, is going to sound kooky, but I think sort of like trusting your your instinct, right? So sort of trusting what's in your in your gut. I think especially like when you're younger, you don't have an enormous amount of life experience coupled with professional experience. And so when I think about sort of where I'm I'm at now, you, again, you kind of combine life experience with professional experience. I, I, this just must sound crazy. I'm, I'm obviously, <laughs> I obviously do due diligence and have research in my background. Yeah. But a lot of, I really, I, I trust that gut, that trust, that instinct, that really, that sort of um, core feeling that you have around things. And I wish, you know, my younger self or what I might share with younger folks, I, I think they sort of tune themselves off to that because it just, it's irrational to a certain degree. I know that's like super weird advice to give to somebody, but I, I'm really big on that right now. I don't know why. I mean, it's a full moon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> could be that right? uh, it's funny you say that though because i've talked a lot about that recently and i think again going back to that we're similar ages like we've we've never been through a global pandemic but we did go through the financial crisis and yes. we've been through some other things and so there are times that i it's funny you bring that up because i've mentioned it that, i mean just in conversations at home recently where i'm like my gut is telling me something you know what i mean like where right. i'm like and i 
and I put a lot more lot more stock into that than I, I think now looking back, I would have say 10, 15, 20 years ago, right? Right. So, it's uh, it's now weird. I'm like, no, that's that means something that let me look at this. Let me look <laughs> so, at it, right? Or yeah. I don't or if I don't know, I, I don't know. Yeah, right? I need to explore that more. So that's I, I love that answer. <laughs> so it, it, it's been <laughs> top of mind for me recently. So has there been a piece of advice or life lesson that you've received that you've found yourself carrying with you throughout your career? Uh, you know, I, this is going to be it's simple, but it's just it, like, keep trying, keep showing up. And obviously like, that's, that's what I do. You know, yeah. I mean, just keep putting yourself out there. And I think too, just sort of being like a lifelong learner, like continue to put yourself out there and learn and, and expand. And I feel like I, I got that from my parents. I feel like I, you know, got that, you know, obviously from school, I got that from the workplace. So yeah, I, I've carried that all the way through. And it sounds like that's something even like when we started the the conversation, you just kept you kept showing up also which, to, to get to where you are today. So I, I, I think that's perfect. And I might already know what this episode's going to be named. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I noticed in the first season were how important mentors were in people's lives as they were coming up. I mean, was that something that was also important for you? And how did they you know help you get to where you are today? Yeah, for sure. I'm really blessed and fortunate. I've worked for the most amazing people throughout my career. And I would say every single one of those people played some form of mentor and, you know, were willing to share, willing to explain, willing to listen and really helped provide opportunity to me that might not have been there other. So yeah, I think both, you know, from people I reported to directly, as well as to be really frank, we have an amazing industry, just an amazing mm-hmm. industry. And there's so many fantastic leaders that have, um, you know, just extended themselves and, and still extend themselves today. I'm very grateful to, you know, some, some credit union CEOs who, when they, you know, heard I was coming here if you know if I need anything, be sure to reach out. They've checked in with me since. It's an amazing industry that I do think is focused on you know supporting. I've been very blessed with mentors in a variety of forms. I couldn't agree with you more. It, there's something about this space, right? Like that the credit right. union community that I've never. That's I think it's why it, it sucks us all in is because everyone's so willing to help or take your call or answer questions or do whatever. So yeah, it's it's a a beautiful, beautiful thing. And we were talking before we hit record too on missing, seeing all the people in person to to, to do that. So, you know, before we move on to the last part of the show, you you mentioned as a leader that a lot of the times it's on, you know, the the credit union, your community is on your mind 24 seven. Yes, Uh, yes. What do you do to relax? To, what do you what's, like? What, what do you do outside of credit unions? So, what does that work life integration look like to you? Yeah, and work life integration is a pretty good way to phrase it. It's, it's pretty <laughs> it's pretty fluid. Um, you know, we've got pretty active life because we've got three kids, right? We've got a fifteen, a thirteen, and a seven. So okay. yeah. we're really focused on. And, and obviously, you know, prior to COVID, you know, everyone had different sports and. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. So we're real active with, with our kids. Um, but, you know, for me, it, it, it's totally, it's all about my family. It's, you know, spending, spending quality time together. Um, you know, I'm, I'm so happy to go outdoors. You know, my husband's like, do you never go outdoors during the day? And I go, well, no, not unless I'm like going to a meeting. So I'm very happy if there's like, you know, sunshine, my feet's on the grass or the sand. Cause that, you know, I'm not doing that every day. So it's, yep. it's the, it's the simple things, right? Just to sort of, you know, decompress that way, connect with people, obviously enjoy, you know, connecting and spending time with, with friends. So simple things. I'm going to just throw this one out there to you. Cause it's been a, something that's been on my mind quite a bit lately. And just like in conversations, you know, with other leaders is any hacks on how to disconnect when we're working from home and kids are home and everything, you know, I mean, it's just like you mentioned that 24 seven, any, any tricks you've picked up over the past few months that you find yourself doing or, <laughs> or just work? <laughs> get up and walk away. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, a, that's exactly it. Yeah. No, it, it, it literally is just sort of like just finding that moment just to like sort of get up and, and, you know, pause. I mean, you know, we, we have pets, we've got two dogs that, you know, always need something. So they, they, they sort of seem to time it where oh, we need some disruption. Can you go outside? and play the or they bring the ball right like, okay, I'll, I'll get up and i'll go outside and play ball with you so yeah, it's hard it is hard to 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 unplug so i think it is just sort of right like getting up and and making it happen yeah. i don't know what have you heard 
Oh, nothing. You I do. think we're all, yeah. That, no, that, <laughs> the walking has been the biggest thing for us, I can tell you. It's just yeah. like the same thing, like whether it's taking a break in the middle of the day and taking the yep. dog for a walk or whatever it happens to be. But I, you know, we're all on so many Zoom calls like you and I are right now. And, you know, just uh, it, yeah. you have to get away from the screen. I personally, that's uh, for me, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and shut it down at night. That's been, yes. Uh, yes. I think that's the other thing. We were all on almost 24 seven in the beginning of this. We need to realize that can't do that forever. <laughs> so. Exactly. We're going to burn out. Right? <laughs> right. So last part of the show, the rapid fire questions, the questions are rapid. Your answers don't have to be. Um, <laughs> what were you like in high school? And do you remember the first time you got in memorable trouble? <laughs> I was going to surprise you. I was kind of goody goody in high school. So I didn't, I didn't get in major trouble. Um, you know, I, I was just someone I like to connect with people. I, I wasn't a popular kid, but I had, you know, friends in the popular crew and I had friends in the not popular crew. So I, I had a good time in high school. Yeah. So no, no memorable trouble that you can think no of? No memorable trouble. Although my mom, <laughs> my mom did have to tell me recently that she was aware that when my best friend and I were sneaking out to TP at night, she just oh. told me that like a year ago. She, um, that she do. <laughs> yes. That we were sneaking you, out and TPing you, the neighbors. <laughs> you thought you got away with it, but mom yes. knew. So, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier about stumbling into credit unions. Most of us did. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? A news anchor. Really? Yes. Uh, did, did, is that something you pursued ever in college or anything? Or is that the communication background? That's or? the communication background. Uh, yeah, I have a master's in media communications. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, do you have any daily routines that if you don't do, your day just feels off? I need my coffee <laughs> first thing in the morning. Um, and I am not a morning person. So I generally... Um, you know, kind of like my first 30 minutes, I don't like to have conversation with anybody. And everybody knows that. <laughs> you need your time. So are you time. a night owl then? Absolutely. I generally go to bed like 12, you know, midnight, one in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah. It's been a funny thing since Lauren came on as the CEO of CU Insight. She is more of a night owl. I'm a early morning. That's my best ah. thing. So we have this, when we're working together, we have this couple hour gap in the middle of the day that works yes. well for both of us. But <laughs> because when she's hitting her stride, I'm like, I'm already winding down. That's a, yes. no, no, no. So yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. We both send each other slacks and emails at very different times. Different and times, we, right? We come back to them. We both know they don't have to be answered immediately. So. Yes. <laughs> it, the, the random question and now i'm really interested to hear this since i know that we're about the same age what's the best album of all time that one you can listen to from front to back without skipping a song well i might be disappointing you in this uh, <laughs> so i love van morrison i I've, I've always loved him i don't know if it's obscure or not but it it's like from the 90s days yeah. like this i love uh, that album i love fantastic. it fantastic first time mentioned on the podcast too so okay we'll cool. link to it everybody should check it out uh i'm a reader jill and i have stacks of books all over the house many have been recommended to us by guests on the podcast is there a book that either you've gifted others or you just think everybody should read you know, I'm a huge fan of Tim Ferriss. So I love Tools of Titans. I gift that one frequently. Um, the other one I gift, and it, it, it might depend maybe on what the person shared with me, is I'm a big believer in the secret. Okay. Yeah. Right? That's so just like what you believe, that, that's what's going to happen. Put it out there. I think you're the second person maybe to mention Tim Ferriss on the show. I have Tools of Titan right behind me. The four-hour work week one. literally changed my life years ago. So, um, Oh, yes. <laughs> I completely, within two, I think within two years of reading it, I closed our offices. We all went remote and I went and traveled the world. So it was, uh, <laughs> I, I, uh yeah, and even a lot of this podcast, I picked in, you know, a bunch of stuff from, from his show. So I hear you there, you know, as you've gotten older, what's become more important. And my favorite part of this question, what's become less important. So, uh, you know, kind of, it's going to be morbid, but again, getting back into that age that we're, we're in, a lot of people dying, <laughs> right? So whether it's, you know, parents, whether it's, you know, people being struck with illness. And so time and connection with people, I, I feel like time is my most precious resource. Yep. And so I will say I, I am very particular about my time and who gets my time. And I'm also just very cognizant of just, you know, making that connection with, with people, with friends, with family, just because time is, is so precious. You never know when time is up. 
I think what's become less important, and this is probably cliche, but just material possessions. And maybe that's just because my family and I have been schlepping all over the state of California. And I'm like, why do we have so much junk? I, I kind of just want to completely like declutter and get rid of everything <laughs> like, yeah, just over my it possessions. Is, it is one of my favorite things to do is to take trips <laughs> right. to Goodwill and just fill a car. Be done with it, right? I, I absolutely love it. And But during this COVID time, uh, not being home, I, I found myself accumulating stuff. And I'm like, why am I doing this? Stop it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's so good about that. But uh, <laughs> there's a question that I didn't send you. When you hear the word success, who is the first person that comes to mind? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, my goodness. The first person. Um I, you know what? I, I don't, I don't have a person that, that comes to mind. I, I think of, of characteristics though, right? Like I think okay. of, I think of people like putting themselves out there. And I guess I'd say too, success, it's different for everybody, right? So you could be thinking, I mean, so recently I just saw this documentary on, on Gloria Alred, which I, you know, so I didn't, I didn't necessarily know much. I honestly like I knew who she is and what her yep. background is, but just watching that documentary in her life. And I'm like, wow, that's a successful person and, and what she's you know done and contributed. I on the flip side, like I, I you know people in my everyday life that maybe professionally you wouldn't classify as successful, but when you look at their lives as a whole and you look at what they've contributed to their family and their community, I'm like, that's a successful person. So yeah, I don't, I don't have like a one person that, that comes to mind, but I do sort of think about that, it, that could be very, very different, you know, based on you know what the person is doing and how they feel about it. It is why it's one of my favorite questions because we all do define, as you said, success differently. So, yeah. like, you know, that, that range of what we can think people are successful for is amazing. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you again, Catherine, for taking the time and being on the show and, and, and sharing your time that, like you just mentioned, that you protect. <laughs> so, uh, with, with me and our, our listeners, my last question for you Do you have any final asks of our listeners or final thoughts you'd like to share today? Oh my gosh. Well, as a start, thank you so much for, for including me. This was so fun. And, and I appreciate you making time for me as well. I guess I would just put out there for folks, like, don't, don't give up. If there's something you want and you want to achieve it in life, like put it out there and keep putting it out there. And I think too, just to be really deliberate about what, what you want and, and what you want to do. It's possible. Anything is possible. I love it. That is the perfect way to wrap this up. Uh, we'll link to everything we talked about in the show notes. Uh, what's the best way for people to reach out to you if they have additional questions? LinkedIn, the Twitter machine, email, what's your poison? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. uh, LinkedIn is always awesome. And email is all, also awesome as well. Um, Kay Davis at valleyfirstcu.org. And I'll also just put out there, if there's ever anything I can do for anybody, reach out. I, you know, I, I like to pay it forward every day, all day. So I'm happy uh, to help anybody I can. That's fantastic. We will link to all of that so people can get a hold of you in the show notes as well. Thank you again so very much and please stay healthy, friend. Thank you. You too. Have a great day. Before we go, I would like to just send out a huge thank you to all of you for listening. We would not get to have this much fun doing what we do if it weren't for all of you. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. And once again, thank you to Catherine for taking the time out of her busy schedule to share her experiences with all of us. And a big thank you to our sponsors, PSCU. Our friends at PSCU have been longtime partners and supporters of CUinsight.com. So please make sure to click on their link in the show notes, give them some love, see everything they have going on to help out the credit union community. Community. Also, we're on all the podcast players. So, Apple, Spotify, Pandora, Stitcher, iHeartRadio. We would greatly appreciate it if you subscribed on your favorite player. Leave us a five-star rating, maybe even a review on the old po Apple podcast machine. It helps with the visibility of the show and us spreading credit union love. And as always, if you don't think we're worth the five stars, feel free to just forget I asked and reach out to me directly and let me know where we can improve. Uh, last thing, the See You Insight Experience podcast book list. Needless to say, we've got you covered. Uh, if you need some stimulation for the old mind, uh, you can get your next book recommendation from the, the guests on our show. Thank you all again so very much for listening and have a great day. Stay healthy, friends. Mm -hmm.